Thank you for that introduction. So thank you for having me. Thank you for being here. There are people actually here. Um, and, uh, and I'm very grateful for this chance, actually, for the first time since the lockdown in the UK started to give a talk in person, which is very exciting. Um, I uh, am incredibly excited to be talking to you guys because when I decided, when, when I was invited by a tour to give this talk, I had a slight moment of hyperventilation because, of, of course, I'm not an international lawyer. Uh, but then Tor sent me some examples of people that have formerly given lectures and actually my hyperventilation increased. Um, and uh, so, so you all have to forgive me. This is probably nothing of the caliber of those who've come before me in the journal. It's absolutely, it was really amazing. I really actually enjoyed reading all of those samples that you sent me. Um, but what this talk will do um, is it's at the beginning of a new project that I'm ho hoping to begin, which connects my work on uh, the, the sort of the politics of infrastructure, logistics, and maritime transportation. Um, and it takes that work in a slightly different direction. So I'm looking no longer at containerization and logistics of that sort, but I am still looking at the transportation of um, uh, goods on the sea, this time of oil. Um, it's a funny thing because um, I'm Iranian, I have taught Middle East politics, and I have, there have been a few subjects that I have steadfastly avoided throughout my career, and oil has been one of them because it's such a cliched subject for people who do Middle East stuff. Um, but once I started researching it, there was actually so many things that I was looking for and I could not find in the literature. And so part of this new project is curiosity about those things that I could not find, at least in English. So um, please bear with me as I test my way through um, this new area of research for me. Okay, um, in 1950, Pablo Neruda published Canto General, Canto General, an epic poem he had begun composing in 1938, and which seismically shifted the stakes of modern poetry. What better way to frame a discussion of oil than by, of, by way of invoking the way it has shaped not only the banal lineaments of everyday life, but also the very shape of literature. So I want to beg your indulgence and begin this talk by reading the entirety of one of the book's poems. Neruda's Standard Oil Company appears in the fifth canto of the book in the section on the oligarchies alongside poems on United Fruit and the Anaconda Copper Mining Company. So here's the poem. When the drill bore down towards the stony fissures and plunged its implacable intestine into the subterranean estates and dead years, eyes of the ages, imprisoned plants' roots, and scaly systems became strata of water. Fire shot up through the tubes, transformed into cool, cold liquid, and the customs house of the heights, issuing from its world of sinister depth, it encountered a pale engineer and a title deed. However entangled the petroleum's arteries may be, however the layers may change their silent sight and move their sovereignty amid the earth's bowels, when the fountain gushes its paraffin foliage, standard oil arrived beforehand with its checks and its guns, with its governments and its prisoners. Their obese emperors from New York are suave, smiling assassins who buy silk, nylon, cigars, petty tyrants, and dictators. They buy countries, people, seas, police, county councils, distant regions where the poor hoard their corn like misers their gold. Standard Oil awakens them, clothes them in uniforms, designates which brother is the enemy, the Paraguayan fights its wars, and the Bolivian wastes away in the jungle with its machine gun. A president assassinated for a drop of petroleum, a million acre mortgage, a swift execution on a morning mortal with light, petrified, a new prison camp for subversives. In Patagonia, a betrayal, scattered shots beneath a petroliferous moon, a subtle change of ministers in the capital, a whisper like an oil tide. And zap, you'll see how Standard Oil's letters shine above the clouds, above the seas, in your home, illuminating their dominions. A pale engineer and a title deed to call petroleum forth from the earth, 
the checks and the guns and a million uh, and a million acre mortgage that come with Standard Oil's dominion over the oil beneath the grounds of others. These are all striking descriptions of the transformation of petroleum into property. Today, the engineers may no longer be pale and Standard Oil has long splintered into more than a dozen companies, some of which have rejoined like two blobs of mercury on a slippery surface. What has not changed is this metamorphosis of planetary resources into commodities to be traded. The naturalization of this odd, even magical idea that vast places and common spaces and unenumerable things can belong to someone or someones, and that humans can be subjugated, enslaved, and murdered in order to defend this ownership is central to the working of global commerce and trade. The fiction of private ownership became hegemonic through European colonization of the tricontinents and has been at the root of modern notions of sovereignty, territoriality, legal personhood, and of course, of modern practices of capital accumulation. As Brenna Bander has shown in her colonial lives of property, possession of land, its usage and exploitation for commerce and ideas around its improvement were central to creating racialized regimes of property and accumulation that persist in one form or another centuries down the line. What is distinct about this new mode of capital accumulation diffused through a European imperium has been its global scale, its hegemonic ambitions, the simultaneous significance of industrial production and commercial exchange, the centrality of finance to its expansion, and the intensified modalities and ideologies of violence it engendered. These new forms of commodification and commerce were backed up with taxes, laws, ordinances, regulations, and primarily and ultimately by the force of the canon. Rosa Luxemburg wrote her in, in her accumulation of capital, every European advance was marked not only with the progress of commodity exchange, but by the smoldering ruins of the largest and most venerable towns, by the decay of agriculture over large rural, land, uh, rural areas, and by intolerably oppressive taxation for war contributions, end quote. In that same passage, Luxembourg goes on to cite as examples the Chinese treaty ports she was writing at the end of the 19th century, where European powers can coercively enforce their own terms of circulation and trade. And at Luxembourg's adds that this ostensibly free trade, and I quote, has been paid for with streams of blood, with massacres and ruin. Commodification of land and humans also extended to what lay within and beneath the earth and the oceans. Extraction from the colonies went hand in hand with the opening of markets for goods produced in Europe and the expertise and knowledge production practices that were more than implicated and imbricated in the work of empire. Circulation, and more specifically maritime transportation, made such planetary movements possible. And counterintuitively, as Jairus Banerjee, the great historian and polymath, has argued in his acute brief history of commercial capital, existing networks of transoceanic commerce and trade of commercial capital made possible processes of commodification and industrial production that came after it. In other words, what I want to argue is that had it not been possible to transport oil in massive volumes to far destinations, then oil would not have become the significant commodity that it has become. The circulation made its commodification possible. It's, a, it's kind of turning the arrow, um, the causative arrow or the sequential arrow right the other way around. I'm speaking about oil and hydrocarbons today, but much of what I say is also applicable to other forms of trade and extracted natural resources. But I speak about oil specifically because the sheer scale and significance of oil as a commodity allows for us to see the strangeness of the naturalized categories and processes having to do with product production and circulation of fossil fuels, but all other also extracted natural goods. We see tankers and refineries and petrochemical plants, and we see them as commonsensical, unquestioned and unquestionable. But today, I also want to specifically speak about the circulation of them. So not just the refineries, but the tankers as well. And the production of, uh, so 
and this is in part the reason that I want to talk about circulation rather than production is in part because of the movement of oil. Despite its vast scale and volume, does not garner the same degree of attention as its production does. Nor does the movement of oil attract as much attention as container ships do, especially, for example, in the wake of that ship blocking the Suez Canal. There is also in this project at stake a Eurocentric, and one can even say this, this emphasis on production of oil. There is a Eurocentric, one can even say an England-centric emphasis on industrial production as the pivot of capitalism. However, as Jairus Banerjee has written, Marx's own recurring characterization of commercial capital as inexorably subordinate to industry and to industrial capital obscures the fact that historically a wide range of industries worked for merchant capital. And the commerce in oil fits this rubric, and I'm going to go through this a little bit. This evening, I will argue that it was uh, the possibility of maritime transport of goods that produced a sphere of transnational trade that in turn, you know, uh, in turn consolidated, crystallized, and intensified the usage of hydrocarbons as the motive force of industry and transport. And as Adam Hani has recently written in an excellent essay on petrochemicals, not only as a motive force, not only as the thing that sort of fuels uh, transportation and industry, but also as the signature ingredient in what Hani calls our synthetic world, plastics. The circulation of trade in oil, uh, the circulation and uh, the circulation of and trade in oil, even more than its production, has been actually at the root of innovations in finance and insurance, in new modalities of exchange, in forms of engineering and construction, and in complex, though always inadequate, legal and regulatory apparatuses. All these hydrocarbon infrastructures came into being because the long distance circulation of oil literally and figuratively unmoored this paraffin foliage this product of subterranean estates from the earth and made possible its mobility and transnationalism. So let's begin with this history. In 1956, the New York Times featured a long essay on the transportation of oil and confidently declared that just as the trireme, galleas, longboats, and clippers were symbols of their own maritime eras, so the tanker is the ship of our century. The statement by the New York Times was not hyperbolic. Ships made possible the gargantuan increase in the consumption of hydrocarbons. At the beginning of the 20th century in 1900, oil fueled only 2.5% of world's energy consumption and almost the majority, the vast majority of that was in the US. And tankers only accounted for only about 1.5% of total mer merchant tonnage of the time. And that tonnage came over from the US where it was produced to Britain, which consumed it more than anybody else. Um, Britain um, and France, which consumed it more than anybody else. By 1938, so about 40 years later, oil had risen to 26% of world's energy consumption and tankers were 16% of world tonnage. By the height of the oil boom in 1972, 60% of the world's seaborne trade was liquid hydrocarbons. So 60% of the ships that were on the sea in 1972 were tankers. Though that percentage plunged after 1973 and today hovers around 35% for crude tankers. But when we add petrochemical and natural gas tankers, a much more new invention, as well as offshore vessels, um, and now these days 25% of the world's oil is extracted from the offshore areas. Uh, when we add all of these vessels, that still increases to 48%. So if you think about it, 48% of the world's tonnage has to do with hydrocarbons, something that you don't hear much about. This is an astonishing volume of planet-destroying fossil cargo traveling across the face of the deeps. How did tankers come about and in what way did they change the world we inhabit? The first ships carrying petroleum across the Atlantic were actually sailing ships. This was in the 1860s. Sailing ships with a cargo of wooden barrels, which is why you, oil is today counted in barrels. So originally they were transport, transported in round wooden barrels. And these ships were primarily owned by British trading companies, merchants, who carried oil like they would any other cargo in packets. 
Though the wooden barrels were later exchanged for cuboid-shaped tents that packed more efficiently and literally were made out of tin, the carriage of oil and other petroleum products in bulk across the ocean was still some time in the coming. In the 1880s, even after sailing ships were fitted with tanks inside their hull, some 90% of transatlantic trade was still carried in these tents. The first modern steamer or tank ship was deployed, however, not on the transatlantic route, which is quite interesting, but for tra traversing the Caspian and the deep water Russian rivers, such as Volga, by uh, Osiri oil, which was being exploited by the Swedish Nobel family of the famous Nobel Prize, who owned one of the largest oil companies in Azerbaijan. These ships, the very first tankers, were first floated in 1878, and they were made out of steel, which was different than a lot of the sailing ships, and had tanks that could expand or contract with temperature changes, and they had ventilation to expel gases produced by lighter hydrocarbons, and perhaps most importantly, they were steam engines that were operating not on coal, but on fuel oil. So for the first time, these were actually steam engines that were employing oil for the transportation. In part, the innovation of using fuel oil operated ships in Azerbaijan came about because in the US, standard oil primarily produced kerosene. So they were using this heavier oil for which was used to fuel ships. And it was much later um, until the end of the century where standard oil decided to actually get involved in having these ships. For its first few decades still, Standard Oil was still dependent on English merchant marine, mariners who preferred to place tanks in their, oil, uh, old, uh, in their old oil sail ships rather than risking investment in the more costly and as yet unproven tankers steaming in the Caspian Basin. But it was in fact an English maritime merchant house whose trade to Asia first tested the possibility of transoceanic tanker trade with oil fueled ships. By 1888, Standard Oil and a number of smaller British trading firms uh, were carrying the oil produced by the Nobels and the Rothschilds Benito Company. So Standard Oil had made these deals with these two other um, big, huge merchant family uh, and banking family um, businesses. But the person who ended up making a huge difference was an old Iraqi Jewish, Iraqi British Jewish merchant from Whitechapel called Marcus Samuel, who operated his own trading company. Um, and the operating, uh, the trading company's logo was a decorative shell because his father used to import shells from uh, various parts for actually for household decoration. Um, Samuel decided, uh, so shells had been their pri primary trading trade commodity, but Samuel decided to break into this oil market and made a deal with the Rothschilds to carry the Benito's oil, their company's oil, from Batumi to Asia through the Black Mediterranean and Red Seas. To do so, he needed to ensure the ships in which he carried oil would meet the exacting standards of the Suez Canal Company. So remember that the Suez Canal Company at this stage was essentially a British and French company. Uh, and in fact, this is around the time, a little bit after the time that the British had taken control of Egypt because of the, uh, because Egypt's inability to pay its debts to them. And the debts were actually accrued over the building of the Suez Canal Company. So it, it all fed into each other. But also, in addition to having to get these ships to go through Suez Canal Company, one of the things that the Samuels realized that at the ports in which these oils arrived, you actually needed a lot of infrastructure to receive these um, uh, ships. You needed accessibility to road or rail or both. You needed foundations firm enough for the immense storage tanks that you needed. You needed enough room beside them for the warehouses where the oil that had arrived in these big tanks could be put into barrels for transport inland, and you needed it for um, wholesale traders. You needed piers or jetties in deep water where the new large tankers, the largest in the world at the time, could come alongside. And you needed shelter from the gales, which was at the time called Sumatra squalls, which could spring up unexpectedly at any time. So you needed an enormous amount of infrastructure to receive these tankers. So from the very first, tankers anticipated the forms of vertical integration or integration along the whole transportation chain, which today defines the efficiencies of, for example, container transportation. 
Even more importantly, what allowed for Marcus Samuel's company to win was that the allegiances of the Suez Canal's national allegiance to Britain, and therefore to Marcus Samuel, who was operating out of London, and Suez Canal's allegiance, commercial allegiance to the Rothschilds who had invested in the Suez Canal, those allegiances mattered. So in a sense, the Suez Canal actually gave permission to Marcus Samuel's company over Standard Oil because of these national attachments. At the same time, Lloyds of London declared that Shell's tankers were safe. And therefore, um, Shell Company was able to evade all of these competitors and became the first major ship to actually go from the Black Sea carrying Azari oil all the way around through the Suez Canal to, to Asia. So what is interesting about this is that technology, webs of commercial and national relation, and intra-imperial rivalries all helped Marcus Samuel's Shell Trading Company to become one of the progenitors of the future oil giant, Royal Dutch Shell. Technological innovation in this instance of initially noble families' use of heavy oils to fuel the ships, and later of Samuel's Shell Company's use of the hull of the ship rather than fitted tanks to carry the oil and therefore to be able to carry a lot more oil, were only one aspect of this process. Another one was the broader political economy of empire. On the one hand, the merchant houses so central to the empire of free trade dominated the early trade in oil. The Rothschild House in France and England and Germany began intensive investment in mines and extractive industries throughout the 19th century, with their Benito Oil Company trading in Azari oil as one of their crown jewels. And precisely because they had also invested in rail transport about 50 years earlier, they also had all of this technological knowledge, but also all of these investments, and they could actually muster up 2,000 oil tank cars to move the oil from Azerbaijan to the coast of the Black Sea. So there's all these kinds of imperial connections that are existing there from, and all these histories that come to fruition at this moment. In addition to the Rothschilds and the Samuels, a great many British firms were involved in the oil business, including the famous Jardines, who were the first merchant houses which later, uh, which were investing in uh, businesses in the empire, and particularly the Middle East, and which then went on ahead and invested in oil transportation. What is also interesting that these merchant houses, like the Rothschilds, went from owning transport and in infrastructures to actually going and buying oil fields. So um, the nobles had already had oil fields, but Shell goes on ahead to acquire oil fields through a proto-merger deal with Royal Dutch in Sumatra. So what we see is the arc of capital investment of these merchant families, which begins with their mastery of transportation and traverses to speculative investment in extractive industries. Even the Nobles and Rockefellers oil businesses flourished because of their ability to control the transportation of the goods they had to sell. The Nobel family owned oil fields and refineries, and Standard Oil developed its power through its monopoly over refining. But the former commissioned the first oil field tank ships, and the latter was the king of vertical integration and had thoroughgoing interdependencies with railways traversing the US and merchant shippers across the Atlantic. Corporate forms that snugly fit empires of free trade and transoceanic transportation were crucial to the development of these businesses. There were all these business inventions, new managerial forms and corporate organizational innovations and all the attendant um, ideologies that came with them. And all of this flourished because of the continental expansion of the US across the Western expanse of the Americas and the European projection of power even more violently and deeply into the reaches of Africa and Asia. So this empire was actually incredibly significant to the encouragement and the flourishing of this maritime trade in oil. But decolonization itself had interesting effects on this transportation. Decolonization shifted the processes by which hydrocarbons are transported from the fields to the refineries and beyond. The nationalization of oil in the era of decolonization, what historian Christopher Dietrich has called an oil revolution, led to the establishment of state-owned oil companies that to varying degrees worked with the oil majors in both upstream and downstream activities. So suddenly the shape of the oil business changes. 
that wants vertical integration of oil companies from extraction in the field to delivery um, at the pumps gave way to complex arrangements, consortium agreements for both extraction and refining, replacement of outright ownership of tankers by charters, and the fragmentation of marketing and trading processes. If in the 1960s, the seven oil majors, many uh, which were uh, BP, British Petroleum, Gulf, Royal Dutch Shell, Texaco, and three descendants of Standard Oil, Chevron, Exxon, and Mobil, if they controlled 90% of global trade in oil, by the end of the 1970s, just over the course of 20 years, their share had plummeted to 42%. And commodity traders rushed in to fill the gap, rebirthing the spot market in oil. So you had this process where you first had the oil companies and the traders separate, then they join up, they all become vertically integrated, particularly during the first 50 years of the 20th century. And then you have decolonization and they split up again, where the ownership of the oil goes to the hands of the national oil companies who work with the majors, but the transportation of oil ends up fragmenting in all of these different ways. And you end up having these commodity traders that step, step into the breach. Um, as a recent investigative, an investigative work by Bloomsburg, uh, Bloomsburg reporters uh, Javier Bla and Jack Farchi has shown uh, on commodity traders has, shows, uh, has shown, decolonization and naturalization of oil proved a boom for these modern merchant houses. They were very similar, these merchant houses, to the old merchant houses of old. Commodity traders' opaque and clubby business practices, private ownership structures, and lack of scruples has resulted in a flattening and spreading of hydrocarbon circulation in a way that makes grasping the shape of the business in total immensely difficult. I will return to this towards the end of this talk. For now, allow me to explain how the global availability of oil has brought with it faster loading and unloading and automation, securitization, and global arbitrage. The business as a whole can speed up or slow down because as geographer Michael Simpson has written, capital accumulation relies not only on the speedy movement of commodities across global space, but rather capital employs pluritemporal pluritemporal strategies of circulation. So you could speed up and slow down based on what you need and essentially a kind of a temporal arbitrage, if you, if you will. Maritime transportation of hydrocarbons in massive super tankers that can also act as temporary storage spaces permits this pluritemporality and intensifies the exploitative aspect of fossil circulation. So let me, let me start with these um, exploitative practices. First, automation. In 1967, the British Transport Docks Board commissioned the management consultants, McKinsey and Company, to produce a report on containerization in, um, in, the, in the UK, in Britain. That year was a cataclysmic year in post-war British history. At the end of 1967, Prime Minister Harold Wilson had declared, decreed withdrawal from the British colony at Aden, where BP had its largest refinery east of Suez. Um, that refinery was built after Iran had nationalized BP's oil. Domestically in 1967, throughout the year, dockers in the country's two most major ports, London and Liverpool, had gone on paralyzing strikes to decasualize the hiring processes at the docks. Uh, at the time, uh, dock workers were not employed. They would arrive at the gate of the docks and they were hired for the day to do the work. So, so their jobs were essentially very casual. As the Minister of Labour, R.J. Gunther, reported to the Parliament, there has, been a, there has been a virtually complete strike of dockers in Liverpool and Birkenhead since 18th of September. In London, the Royal Group, West India and Millwall docks, and to a lesser extent, London and St. Catherine's docks, have all been affected. These strikes, which are unofficial, now involve about 16,000 men and have caused serious interference with trade, in particular with exports. Dockside um, protests around decasualizations were re restricting the circulation of goods and raw resources that had been so fundamental a factor in the post Second World War boom in Europe. In this climate, containerization was seen as a major mitigation for this unruly and intransigent workforce whose demands for better wages and working conditions were eating into the profits of the shipping companies. McKenzie's suggestion was the mechanization of docks 
biocontainerization, which it argued would better utilize material resources through imp improved process control. More importantly, McKenzie promised that, and I quote, expensive labor can be replaced, replaced with cheaper capital equipment, end quote. The promise of automation as a solution to unruly dockers, McKinsey reasoned, was already proven in another maritime transport sector. McKinsey reported the distribution of petroleum products is highly automated. The combined use of super tankers, high speed automatic pumps, the large capacity inland pipelines result in an extremely efficient integrated transport system. So automation is the way to go if you don't want to pay for your workers. This capital investment inevitably drove a process of monopolization in business structures and economies of scale in the material plant needed for shipping. But McKinsey showed that in the oil industry, these economies of scale had resulted in staggering cost savings or profits of up to 30% per unit. Automation has always been the holy grail of capitalists looking to cut costs. Moving oil was from the very first a space of automation. Standard Oil's pipelines and pumps cut out the Teamsters, and Nova Oil's um, pipelines cut out the Cossack Ar um, Arava drivers of Azerbaijan. But the problem with pipelines is limitations on the size of the pipes, but perhaps even more significantly, the transnational border crossings that makes pipelines vulnerable to geopolitics. More significant still is that pipelines can be sabotaged, effectively acting as a choke point on production. Maritime transportation is by contrast scalable, more flexible in its carriage capacity, and immune to crossing contentious land borders. It takes advantage of the indeterminate sovereignties of the high seas, and if you're fortunate enough to be headquartered in a country where navies and armies will defend corporate profits, your safety at sea is guaranteed. The material practices involved with tanker trade meant that port side work could be automated from very early on. For example, while emptying the hold of a ship from barrels or even tins of oil could require dozens, even hundreds of stevedores, loading and unloading tankers required only three dock workers. So this text that I'm reading is from a 1950s manual on, uh, on uh, oil transport. You only need one at the tank farm on the ridge to turn on the main tap, one at the switchgate manifold, handling an intricate system of dials by which to guide the required products at the, uh, the right rate to the tanker, a ta and a task which is a task rendered recently more complicated by the export of refined products as well as crude. So if you have multiple things going, uh, it's a little bit more complicated. And one man in a little office on the jetty beside the tanker to supervise the loadings. So this is just three uh, people. In fact, this parsimony in the required number of workers was a major factor, for example, in the Greek shipping magnet Aristotle Onassis's decision after the Second World War to focus his investment only on tankers rather than or ore carriers or general cargo ships like most other Greek um, ship owners. As one of Onassis's biographers wrote, tankers were the most automated ships at the time. Hook up a hose, turn up a valve, and a tanker was loaded in half the time it would take to, uh, to pack a freighter's hold using clumsy slings and cargo winches. It took dozens of stevedores to load a freighter, and these men cost money thanks to strong unions controlling such ports as New York and London. Oil could be siphoned aboard with as few as six men or three, as the manual that I read showed, if the unions aren't looking, end quote. The fact that ships had fewer sailors, required fewer dock workers, and everything depended on the speed of the pumps, meant that the turnaround time at the ports were also much faster. In 1956, when container shipping was still in the future, uh, where sailors were managing the cargo and the vessels aboard ships and stevedores emptying bulk ships still exercised great disruptive power on the vessels and at ports, the New York Times sang the praises of life led by tanker men. The New York Times wrote, at sea, the tanker man lives pretty much as does the freighter man, except that there is more of it, where the big tanker spends little time in the port. She is in this afternoon to start spilling out her cargo, and after 18 hours, it's off again for tomorrow for a month or two. So the quick turnaround time and intense work time at port, the paucity of leisure time, and the distance between oil terminals and the city also translated into a life of isolation, 
the New York Times piece actually quite liked this life of isolation. It said, one advantage in his way of life, maybe the money he's actually, maybe the money, he's actually somewhat better paid than the freighter man, and he can save a lot, for there isn't much to spend his wages on, i.e. he can't go do R&R &R at the port. The oil-loading ports in faraway lands are isolated, not near the white lights. A man can use up most of his day in port, getting to and from the nearest hotspot. And since they couldn't do that, they could save money, which the New York Times saw as a really great benefit. Of course, what that meant was that these guys were spending all their time working on the ships, which is actually what container um, sailors today complain about. The intensification of the workday, the meager time spent at the port, and the very shrinking geography of seafarers' time of rest allowed for further extraction of surplus value from their labor. Automation, though, wasn't the only mechanism through which profit was ext extracted from the circulation of oil. The inherent transnationalism of the maritime transportation of hydrocarbons made possible international arbitrage. The Shell Company was, from the start, aware that one of the primary benefits of the bulk transport of Azari oil to Singapore was that inexhaustible reservoir of cheap labor. That, that uh, phrase actually comes from their own documentation, uh, which could fill and pack the oil in freshly manufactured, unrusted tin packaging ready for the market. Instead of standard oil, oil, which was arriving in rusty tins already packed using more expensive American labor. So the Shell Company figured out that this kind of this form of wage arbitrage in Singapore could save them a lot of money, and they were absolutely right. The packaging also was manufactured in Singapore itself from Malay tin mines. The cost instead of Welsh tin. The cost of labor and materials in Singapore was a fraction of what Welsh tin or European labor cost. And the tanker made possible the exploitation of this inexhaustible reservoir of cheap workers. A longer lasting and insidious, uh, even more insidious method of disciplining labor was the introduction of offshoring of shipping ownership. This form of regulatory arbitrage is formally called open registries, where ship owners can register their ships to a different country's registry and fly that other country's flag. The International Transport Workers Federation calls open registries flags of convenience. In the, world, in the words of the sublime essayist John McPhee, the convenience being that taxes can be avoided, insurance can be to a considerable extent ignored, and wages attractive to ship owners can be paid to merchant sailors drawn from any part of the world. The world's most famous flags of convenience are Panama and Liberia, among many others, um, the other ones being Marshall Islands, Cyprus, Honduras, and Bahamas, as well as some landlocked uh, countries like Mongolia, all of whom are steadfast allies or clients of the US. Open registries at the time of their devising in the early 20th century were analogous to concessions granted to British companies by British colonial officials. An overseas bounty given to metropolitan companies by the metropolitan colonial power over there. In all of these places, when the open registries were set up, they, the, the, the countries where uh, they were set up were essentially um, extend, uh, extended territories of the US. In Panama, Liberia, and Honduras, the companies set up to manage the ship registries were either headquartered in the US or operating according to US corporate guidelines. The most egregious was Liberia, where Edward Cetetinus, formerly, um, uh, Cetetinus, formerly Franklin Roosevelt's Secretary of State and Ambassador to the UN, set up a registry whose, whose headquarters are still today located in Vienna, Virginia. This registry repatriates a substantial portion of the fees that is supposed to go to Liberia back to the US. When it was originally established, that percentage was 60% of the profits. So it was an extraordinary way to actually, on the one hand, extract fees from ship owners, but on the other hand, repatriate or expatriate this, these fees to the US. Um, as Rodney Carlyle, the foremost historian of open registries, writes, for public consumption, Statinius promoted the operation in non-profit humanitarian terms. But for other more specialized um, audiences, such as um, investors or Liberia company executives, Stettinius hinted at the profits possibilities in the rich iron deposits at Bomi Hills, which rivaled Swedish ore for purity, and that those registries allowed for that ore to be carried away. <laughs> 
So from the very first, extraction on colonial terms was interwoven with shipping in its most exploitative, profit-maximizing form possible. The earliest ships to be flagged to the Panamanian and Honduran flags of convenience were the banana boats of the United Fruit Company and the tankers of Standard Oil. Surprise, surprise. If in 1900, 56% of the world's oil carrying fleet had been flagged to Britain and only 3% to the US, by 1948, 10% of the world tanker tonnage was carried on ships flagged to Panama. Just very quickly, they took over. US owned tankers that are actually owned to the US but fly flags of con convenience dominate flags of convenience. That, and in part, they, that's because they can actually pay a lot less wages. Today, nearly half of all oil tankers and offshore vessels and one third of all gas carriers fly under only four flags of convenience, those of Panama, Marshall Islands, Liberia, and the Bahamas. The irony, of course, is that the fuel extracted and carried by these vessels is primarily responsible for the rise in ocean levels that threatens to inundate the two archipelagic nations among those, Marshall Islands and Bahamas. International Registries Inc., which operates the Marshall Islands Open Registry and represents the country in international maritime conferences, is also based in Virginia in the US. At various conferences that have attempted to limit emissions from ships in order to prevent climate change and attend the rise in sea levels, International Registries has vetoed any effective action, ironically increasing, the, increasing Marshall Islands exposure to oceanic inundation until a very recent and thus far ineffective intervention by Marshall Islands Interior Ministry. In a recent New York Times report about the International Maritime Organization's inaction over ship emissions, the Marshallese minister trying to reclaim the registry from IRI lamented that, and I quote, my voice is coming from my ancestors who saw the ocean as something that brought us wealth. Today we're seeing it as something that will bring us our ultimate death, end quote. The most central and primary characters of shipping, its mobility, its transnationalism, its habitation of spaces where sovereignty is divisible, ambiguous, and ultimately decided by asymmetries of power, are what allows these forms of labor and regulatory arbitrage. Open registries are among the most normalized form of offshoring. Some may argue that they bring a form of rent income to countries that have no other resources. But these forms of arbitrage, of course, take advantage of the economic desperation of formerly colonized countries, which in the absence or with the decline of other commodities like sugar, cotton, bauxite, or oil, sell the kind of offshoring services that permit the corporations involved in shipping to continue transporting the very commodity that deals death to them. As Ryan Jobson writes in the account of climate catastrophe in the Caribbean, flags of convenience do not suffice as a proxy for decolonization. From the very start, threat of disruption was central to the working of oil transportation. In the oil fields, I, I want to talk about this threat of disruption also because so, thus far we've just talked about all this incredible depressing power that oil transportation holds. In the oil fields of Pennsylvania, the teamsters who transported packets of oil from the fields to railway termini could dent the profits of Standard Oil and challenge its monopoly and vertical control. The solution, as in the case of uh, Azerbaijan, was the use of pipelines and pumps to push out these disruptive workers with their leverage. Though in the long term they succeeded, in the immediate aftermath of the introduction of pipelines, the Teamsters engaged in disruptive sabotage, um, sorry, though in the long term they failed, in the immediate aftermath of introduction of pipelines, the, teams, uh, the Teamsters engaged in disruptive sabotage. In Ida Tarbell's incendiary account of Standard Oil, she writes about how, and I quote, the Teamsters saw the pipelines meaning first and turned out in fury, dragging the pipes, which was for the most part buried to the surface and cutting it so the oil would be lost. It was only by stationing an armed guard that they were held in check. The Teamsters did more than cut the pipe. They burned the tanks in which the oil was stored, laid in wait for employees, threatened with destruction the well which furnished the oil, and so generally and so generally terrorized the country that the governor of the state of Pennsylvania was called upon in April 1866 to protect the property and men of the oil companies. 
The day of the Teamsters was over, however, and the more philosophical of them accepted the situation. Scores disappeared from the region and scores more took to drilling. They died hard and the cutting and plugging of pipelines was for years a pastime of the remnant of their race." End quote. And the oil terminals, the oil companies had no more success. Even with a handful of people needed at the terminals, the oil companies had to contend with highly skilled workers who could down tools or even sabotage the very expensive equipment. In my research on the Arabian Peninsula, one of the things that was extraordinary was this place that is actually known for extraordinary disciplining of workers, has this unbelievable history of labor mobilization in the 1960s. For example, during one 1968 strike in the British protectorate of Qatar, Qatar wasn't uh, independent yet, the deputy ruler offered replacement workers to the oil company, which was a subdivision of British Petroleum. But the oil company politely refused the offer of scab labor, and I quote from the archival sources, partly because marine operations could be dangerous with inexperienced workers, and partly because the company does not wish to provoke sabotage on its equipment, end quote. But also, oil brought out from underground is of no use if it cannot be circulated. And the shipment of oil is dependent not only on dockers, terminal workers, and seafarers, it is also dependent on people we don't necessarily think about. For example, in 1961, during a two-day uh, two strike in Qatar, pilot boat crews stopped work. Pilot boats are small, powerful boats, captained by seafarers with deep and extensive experience of a given port's contours that help larger tankers berth in the terminals. The strike of the pilot boat crews meant that though battery oil was being produced, once the storage tanks were filled, oil could not be shipped, uh, nor could it be pulled from the ground. This meant that the workers, in fact, had quite a great deal of leverage over how much oil uh, could be shipped. In this case, the oil company was supported by the British uh, government of Qatar, whose police force violently suppressed the strike. One way to insulate the transportation of oil from cities, other workers, and agitators is to move oil terminals away from the city centers and oil loading boys a mile offshore at sea, which is a form of, uh, sorry, two um, oil loading boys a mile offshore at seas, which is itself a form of spatial arbitrage. In both the case of oil terminals and container terminals, there are often logical explanations given. There are more space for container storage, health and safety reasons for loading fuel on board ships, though crude oil is generally so heavy and stable, which is not actually considered volatile. Uh, finished products are much more volatile. Single boy moorings and offshore oil terminals both distance the loading and unloading of tankers from city centers, making the ships less subject to sabotage or attack. But they're also away from population centers where politically irrepressible crowds of workers can be supported by populations. Because oil extraction facilities like oil fields are bounded, spatially dense and grounded, and highly securitized, it is longer more extensive and more diffuse and less surveilled spaces of transportation that can be sites of disruption. The recent indigenous movements in Canada and the Dakotas to stop pipelines carrying oil extracted from tar sands or through fracking are examples of how disruptions to transport may provide an alternative form of resistance to the environmental damage reached by hydrocarbons. The wet sweat and people's blockade of trains in Western Canada's disputed territories and the Standing Rock protest camps against the Dakota Access Pipeline by the Osseti Sequin, the Great Sioux Nation, are only the latest round of struggles of indigenous nations of North America, and I quote, against the trespass of settlers, dams, and pipelines across their territories, as indigenous scholar Nick Estes has extensively analyzed. Of course, these moments of resistance have faced enormous state violence and innovations in dissent have come up against novel forms of intelligence gathering and policing. Stuart Hall's perspicuous writing on the Grundrisse, which formed the basis of his foundational work on policing, puts points to the interconnections of modalities of production to policing. Hall argues that, and I quote, the presence of modern bourgeois legal relations in the police far from indexing the universality of the capitalist system, shows how each mode of production, and Hall may have added circulation and consumption, requires 
and produces its own legal, juridical, and political structures and relations, end quote. Here is where I return to the role of commodity traders in this new mode of production and circulation of hydrocarbons. Moving oil has made possible the diffusion of oil process, uh, of the processes of production and circulation. If once a standard oil monopolized and controlled the entirety of a hydrocarbon supply chain, today we have the national oil company controlling some fields, the majors others, and independent oil companies still others. Modes of production, offshoring, fracking, arctic drilling, and extracting from tar sands have all made the process much more complex and propagated across a far more extensive expanse of the planet. Commodity traders, with their command of the process of circulation, have created new webs of trade in hydrocarbons. If climate campaigners, activist investors, or courts can influence the decision of hedge funds and oil majors to shift away from hydrocarbons, national oil companies and the opaque and secretive commodity traders are not subject to the same pressures or at least not to the extent that publicly traded and much more visible and familiar older oil companies, oil majors are. Recently, there was a court case in um, the Netherlands, which actually demanded that Shell stop production in some of its fields. Um, there are also active, activist investors in the US trying to um, do the same thing with ExxonMobil. But in fact, the courts and activist investors do not hold the same power with uh, commodity tra traders, in part because of the kind of anonymity of these commodity traders. Who here recognizes the names of uh, Vittel, Gangor, Trafigur? Do you guys have, heard, have you guys heard of these oil companies? Whereas we all have heard of Exxon or BP or Shell. I actually have a little, um, uh, a, a little graph that in fact shows that Vittel uh, carries something like 8 million barrels of oil per day, every day. So and we don't know of this company. In the latter half of the 19th century, when the great merchant houses entered extractive industries, they created subsidiary joint stock companies which acted as consultants to float extractive businesses while securing a not insubstantial ownership share in the same firms. So you had these incredibly complex corporate shapes. As Niall Ferguson, and I'm kind of sorry to quote Niall Ferguson, um, <laughs> but his book on the Rothschilds is absolutely amazing, actually. As Niall Ferguson writes in his account of the House of Rothschilds, these firms were, quote, a way for, respectably, for respectable city firms to conduct what was widely regarded as a highly speculative kind of business without directly risking their good names. Extraction was disreputable. Today's, today's commodity traders move vast volumes of oil across the world's oceans under the cloak of invisibility that private ownership, relative lack of press scrutiny, and lax regulations provide, not to mention nefarious deals with warlords of both the North and the South. They operate in the interstices of legal regimes and national laws while wholly protected by the legal regimes of property and profit. And they make possible the sale of hydrocarbons from one corner of the globe to another, even if it kills us and them. So to conclude, in his incandescent black Marxism, Cedric Robinson points to the creation of the racialist ideologies that were themselves also accretions of capital and which facilitated the resolution of its internal contradictions. Robinson writes about the sequential and overlapping processes that constituted the making of commodity production, the recruitment, training, and disciplining labor, the transportation of goods and raw materials, the political and legal structures of regulation and trade, the physical and commercial apparatuses of markets, the organization and instruments of instrumentation of communication, and the techniques of finance and banking. For all this infrastructure to function, rebellions in the internal and external peripheries need to be suppressed. The technology used for this suppression, Robinson persuasively argues, was race, or the transmutation of differences in location or belonging into pernicious epidermic hierarchies. What moving oil has made possible has been the consolidation of global variegations so characteristic of colonial racialization.
The transnationalism of circulation makes a world of variously racialized spaces where the movement of commodities allows taking advantage of spatial, temporal, labor, and legal arbitrage and facilitates exploitative policies, politics. It is the lubricant that allows for transnational interconnections that create profits while maintaining contained, territorialized, bounded, and policed spaces, territories, nations. It is a form of transnationalism in which capital, though often based and emanating from specific territories, deterritorializes itself and accumulates in movement of goods also deterritorialized from the earth. Moving oil leaves global inequalities intact and sunders international solidarities. Pablo Neruda's Canto General created a common revolutionary chronotope, a past and a place familiar to all in Latin America. His epic included mythical histories that dared to name shovels and machinery and transnational companies as engines of his poetry. If we are to blow up the pipelines, as Andreas Malm has suggested in his Ecopolitical uh, eco Manifesto, we need a map of the world that the circulation of oil has built. We need to understand the transnational spaces, places, corporations, financial instruments, and management practices that the trade in hydrocarbon, not its production, but the trade in hydrocarbons, has made possible and makes possible every day. For this, we need to understand how oil moves. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Lorraine. Pleasure. A wonderful sweeping account of, uh, of so much from, from uh, the crystallization of an early capitalist world economy uh, built on commodity flows through to decolonization, through to the present world, uh, all of which, of course, um, themes of which international law and legal regulation lie at the heart of. Um, let's open it up to questions. I wonder. If, uh, let's see, do we need to open up the Q&A function on here? I think the chat can do uh, I think it is open. So I'd encourage our online audience to pose any questions you'd like, either with the uh, in the chat function or the Q&A function. Uh, but let's start with our live audience. And I see a number of hands. So go ahead. Thank you so much. Or divorce, so you know, I, I, I'm almost unable to answer questions. <laughs> um, but uh, I sorry, would you mind introducing yourself? As sorry, well? yeah. So I'm one of Gary's colleagues at NSC. So I'm Luke Mandala, very nice uh, to meet you, an uh, assistant professor in, in intellectual property law. Oh, excellent. What what you talked about, what you, you know, it's made me think a lot about my own subject, of course, which I know you you've commented on very eloquently in the past. Um, but I wanted to ask you, I guess, two questions. One. I don't think you mentioned China in your talk, no. so I'm interested to know what your thoughts are, because, you know, if we're going to move ever to a post-oil future, China is going to have to be part of that. But right now, it's as rapacious as any other big capitalist power. Right? So I wonder what you thought about that. And secondly, um, you know, within this huge study that you've done, um, there's also kind of micro studies that maybe you might want to pursue in um, in tandem or afterwards. I mean, I'm thinking about Britain. I mean, mm -hmm. um, and also Norway as as, yeah. as countries that discovered oil at slightly different times, but only slightly, and took completely different models of society with, with that. And you know, Thatcher used the oil in the North Sea to as a way of essentially cutting down the coal union. Yeah. So one form of carbon replaced another. Yeah. Um, but within that then, um, as you mentioned other, other ways, the labor movement was completely cut asunder because at the same time that hundreds of thousands of jobs that were well-paid, unionized, working class jobs went, the jobs that did replace them in the North Sea were jobs that you were not allowed to unionize at mm -hmm. all. And you were a completely isolated, independent contract. You virtually, you were relatively well paid. You virtually no employment. Mm -hmm. And then you know the contrast with Norway, where they used a similar bonanza to create a kind of form of, of oil socialism. Yeah. So I guess those, you know, the, the, those those two things are the only things that I can think of that weren't in in your 
your study, and so I'm just curious to know your thoughts. But I know you know you've already covered so much that there might there may be too much in what what uh, I've, I've asked you to do. So, so uh, actually, that's that's quite easy to answer. But uh, this project, um, I've just put in a grant application for a very very. Uh, large, long project where I can do this specifically focus on these uh, six aspects of oil, the finance, the offshoring, labor, and a couple other things. Um, because I'm really interested on uh, of oil transportation, of not oil itself. And so one of the things that's really interesting about what you mentioned about the UK and Norway is that, of course, you're absolutely right. The pre-existing modalities of uh, social relation, uh, existing um, strength of the sort of the labor movements, but also the, the, the particular legal apparatuses that were brought to bear on all of these processes were enormously important in shaping the subsequent um, ways in which oil was used. And to me, it's fascinating, for example, that the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund, which is one of the biggest in the world, is now talking about actually no longer investing in oil itself, which is um, Fascinating, actually, if one thinks about it. Um, so UK and Norway are um, particularly interesting because of the way that the UK was central to the various webs of transportation of oil. Um, the Thatcher story, of course, also echoes a much earlier period. Tim Mitchell writes about this in his Carbon Democracy, um, in which uh, actually this, the early discovery of oil and the setting up of the Anglo-Persian oil company, later to become BP, uh, was instrumental in the first round of closing down of mines, of, of coal mines. And so it was the first round of trying to undermine those four forms of mass democracy, is what Mitchell argues. And of course, then Thatcher finished the job in 19, uh, late 1970s, early 1980s. Um, because I'm focusing mostly on transportation, the UK, uh, the UK's own production process is not as central to it. Norway is a different story. So Norway not only has this incredible kind of history of um, exploration in the North Sea, which parallels but never really quite conjoins that of the US, uh, that of the UK, um, also has an actually completely disconnected history of um, running tankers. It's one of the biggest, uh, along with Greece, it's one of the biggest um, tanker owning countries in the world. And, um, and what's fascinating about Norway is that they started doing that the, the tankers that they had actually started as whalers as whaling ships um, which were then converted to tankers um, but uh, but Norwegian oil shipping has been crucial in this movement of oil throughout the world um, whereas container ship companies are tend to be very monopolized and tend to be extremely uh, they tend to, tend to have or uh, extremely large sets of ships that they uh, cover oil tanker owners have far fewer numbers and there's more of them and so there's a lot more greeks and norwegians in this business than there are in the container business but that makes norwegians really quite interesting in that regards as well because they uh technological innovations the diffusion of the process the fact that they have they actually allow for all of these ships to be registered um and uh, not only the ships themselves but the businesses that own the ships to be registered mostly in the caribbean um in offshore um, sites it actually encourages that form of offshoring that form of legal arbitrage that happens within the transportation of ship, uh, shipping. And Norway is definitely one of the places that I'm hoping to study. In fact, I've put in, in the grant application money for somebody who speaks Norwegian so that I could get them to do some of that research. Um, China's uh, situation is really interesting. So um, China and the US in the last five years have constantly passed each other as um, sort of the biggest consumers of oil. Um, they, they, they constantly are neck and neck. Um, interestingly, however, uh, China imports more than the US does because China doesn't have oil fields, whereas US, especially with fracking, is actually now a net exporter um, of oil, uh, or on, in some years, in the last five years, has been a net, a net, net exporter of oil. What is interesting about China is that unlike American firms, it has not tried to create the same transportation apparatuses for oil that it has so successfully done for containerization. 
To me, that's also really interesting because it has very successfully depended for the transportation of oil to its ports where it takes delivery of this uh, elixir for its industry. Um, it has essentially depended on existing infrastructures for transportation, which means on commodity traders and on the shipping companies of the national oil companies, as well as the smaller independents for transporting oil. To me, that's also fascinating because it means that on the one hand, while China is this sort of a giant economic power, it is entirely dependent on existing capitalist relations, on existing corporate forms, on existing sets of legal practices in order to do the kind of thing it does. And so if we really are wanting to understand how China does this and to what extent it has an influence in here, we have to understand these all of this other uh, already existing sets of maritime infrastructures that provide the oil to China um, and of which, you know, of whose uh, sort of business China benefits ultimately. Um, but it is to me interesting that difference is also significant. I think you do, you do point to something quite important, which is that China has invented a huge huge container transport um, infrastructure for taking away the goods that it produces, but it has not been as intensely involved in producing an import infrastructure for uh, oil in particular. With bulk goods, it has. So that also says something about the way that it operates in concert with, for example, the commodity traders and the Middle Eastern oil producers uh, and Russia as well um, in, in, in getting access to oil. So the, the relations there are slightly different than everybody else's, but fascinating. So that's where China stands on that. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Ali. It's always such a pleasure. It's so informative. Uh, thank you for having me here. I'm Charlie Packer. I'm a PhD candidate here at LC Law. Um, I wonder if you might share with us further thoughts about your analysis of activist investors. I know you mentioned that. I don't know to what extent it's part of the bigger project, but really interested, especially connected to your other work, to hear your take on that. Um, I know there's been a lot written recently about this being a very promising avenue, but in a lot of ways, it does seem like one of these corporate band-aids, reminiscent of cap and trade, obviously it doesn't account for all the other work that you mentioned with indigenous activism and all these other uh, approaches taking place. So uh, yeah, we'd love to hear your thoughts, especially with the conference of Glasgow coming up next week. Yeah, really fabulous question. So I think one of the things that should you know, the, the new meme that's going around with the little red flags on Twitter that should set off like bunches of these little red flags going um, is the fact that one of the biggest activist thing, investors is BlackRock. So I think that probably says uh, uh, activist investors against um, fossil fuel. I think what is happening there is something that uh, one begins to see emerging in the last 10 or 11 years and a lot of the international institutions including united nations environmental institutions have been involved in which is the transformation of natural resources into asset classes in order for example supposedly to allow for these ecological asset classes to be protected but essentially what it does is financializes um, what is above ground financializes the ocean it financializes the earth and i think that blackrock is very invested in this because, of course, this allows for the, that transformation of everything into property, um, which benefits it because of the particular investment strategies it has. Now, what is also interesting about this particular aspect of investor activism is that, on the one hand, a BlackRock can come in and can, to some extent, mess with ExxonMobil, for example, which is what it, what they've been doing, um, and and have tried to with Chevron and have not been 100% successful. Um, but the outcome of it, of course, is that um, in, in these cases um, where the majors are influenced by the activists, investors, the business shifts ground elsewhere. And in fact, while a BlackRock may be waving the flag of green energy, the banks are still bankrolling some of the most destructive forms of extraction, which are taking place um, under the noses of everybody because the majors are not involved in it. It's actually, for example, a lot of the fracking in the US is happening by small independents. 
Um, offshoring requires a lot more offshore um, ex extraction, requires a lot more capital investment, and that's often the majors that are involved in that, or national oil companies. Uh, but with so much of the fracking, or so much of the tar sands, it's actually independence to do that, and the banks are very happy to hand them money. So, on the one hand, it's interesting to see BlackRock go against an ExxonMobil or Chevron, but on the other hand, there is this shift to all of these other producers that are doing what they need to do. And then, of course, as I said, offshore is now 20 to 25% of all the oil produced, which is itself something quite alarming, something quite devastating something quite horrific because aside from the fact that it produces oil often there's all sorts of problems associated with that oil being produced and uh, leakages and destruction of the habitat and things like that and black rocks not really affecting much of that at the moment anyway we have a very reticent online audience uh perhaps there's more questions there is actually um there's a question that says i wonder about the rise of nuclear power as a reaction to the two oil crises of the 1970s here there's a very different territorial infrastructure of nuclear energy than with the oil pipeline containerization and offshore trading volume of plutonium trade with uh, decolonized africa and transboundary nuclear hazardous waste trade is far more modest than the global tonnage of fossil fuel absolutely nuclear energy does not displace the oil tanker economy, far from it, but the, but the diversification of energy sources itself is a consequence of the fear of industrial states to be engulfed by the oil tanker economy, which relies on contentious freedom of navigation in the straits and geopolitical fault lines in the Gulf, etc. Not as much a question as a reflection on energy diversification to prompt the reflection on energy infrastructure as an adaptive complex system. Um, really fascinating question. And actually, one of the things that's interesting about this, one of the things that's interesting about the fact that the supposed fear of shortages and an oil boycott by Gulf countries was used to develop nuclear energy, and in particular in France, but also elsewhere here in the UK and elsewhere in Europe. One of the things about it that's interesting, and there's more and more people doing research on this, is that there was actually never really an effective oil boycott. In fact, um, in something I've written recently, I dug up some New York Times articles, uh, which actually they enumerated the number of ships that were coming into Rotterdam, because the Netherlands was one of the supposed uh, places that the um, Arabs were going to boycott. And they, there was actually more ships coming from Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, and the other countries that were supposedly had, had a boycott um, delivering oil than there had been in September before the boycott took place. And so in, in December versus, versus September. So. Um, Bob Vitalis um, in his oil craft argues that, in fact, that um, notion of scarcity was created in order first to sort of challenge the process of nationalization of oil that was um, under steam at that stage. Because the nationalization really started with the late 1960s and went on through the 1970s. And so by creating this fear of the baddy Arab, um sort of uh bogeyman there was that there is this you know you can actually go on ahead go on ahead and generate uh a, a kind of a notion of scarcity but the second thing is that that actually also helped these oil companies to shift from crude production to value-added refining um, and i think that has actually been one of the biggest characteristics and one of the things that's really interesting about Vital Trafigur and all these other oil um, commodity traders is that they are rather than investing in oil fields, they're investing in refining capacity, which is also, if you think about it, it's the value added process rather than the crude production extraction out of the ground. Um, it's it's you know sort of a natural progression of industrial production, and I think that that is. Um, uh, that's one thing to mention. In terms of the diversification as a sort of an adaptive complex system, um, that's absolutely right. We've never had a clear cut transition from, I don't know, steam to coal to oil to whatever. Um, in fact, there's always been completely interwoven, overlapping, continued use of these different um, uh, energy um, sources. And in fact, I was just reading something very recently about how um, because of China's lack of access to oil, they actually reopened some of their coal, you know, sort of coal fired um, uh, energy production uh, plants. Uh, and that has also been the case, actually, in a lot of other places. Uh, in 19... 
seven uh, during the Iran Iraq war when oil production dipped a bit because of because of the war that was going on in Iran and Iraq, a lot of coal uh, carriers were brought out of small holding. So yeah, these happen all the time. And the adaptiveness doesn't go towards new modalities. It actually just sometimes goes back to the old um, fuels. There is one more question. Shall I read it to Please. save you from reading and answering the question? So we've got a question on, um, uh, let's see. Uh, in states in conflict such as Syria, where we have a regime claiming sovereignty over the Syrian territory, and yet has no control over the natural resources such as the oil, the fact is that this regime is lacking an important element of sovereignty, which is controlling the natural resources. What would, what, what, would consider, what would be considered to be the legal status of the Syrian regime who decides when the Syrian regime purchased oil from Kurdish controlled areas, does this con contract or legal engagement constitute a recognition of the legitimacy of the Kurdish rule over those areas? And is that recognition from the regime by purchasing the other party's oil indicative of some kind of legal recognition over the territory, over territorial control? No, it isn't the recognition. Uh, I mean, it's kind of interesting because a lot of people would talk about, in fact, there was, a, there, was, there was a period of time where there was a ship carrying Kurdish oil, which was apparently uh, commissioned by son-in-law of Erdogan uh, to sell this oil somewhere. Um, and the ship actually went around a lot of different places and nobody would take it because it was Kurdish oil. So you, ostensibly, you would think that, yeah, so then it, it, by not taking this oil, they were saying we're not recognizing the sovereignty of the Kurds as an independent state. But in fact, eventually that oil was taken up. And the reason and the, way, the, the mechanism through which it was taken up was by it's being sold to some commodity traders who then went on ahead and took it on. So the fact is that sovereignty these days is so incredibly diffused in these particular ways and corporations have such an incredible central interwoven inseparable role in the processes of extraction and circulation of oil that it's hard to say this oil is from Kurdistan anymore because once it's bought by a commodity trader it essentially changes its character there is an attempt still to enforce for example notions of old school notions of sovereignty um, but I think ultimately, when it comes to international processes, there are all these corporate actors that can actually negate that. As for the case of Syria recognizing the production of oil, I would think that the violence of the Syrian regime shows that they will do whatever they need to instrumentally. They may buy this oil when they need it, and then when they don't need it, go and crush the Kurdish area if they so wish. Uh, it's, it's an incredibly violent state that knows it can get away with what it needs to and so they do what they do i, I think we were supposed to end around now but Great. i'm going to use my prerogative as, as moderator to, to ask my own question yes you, please really. so uh, at the risk of projecting my own interests onto to your talk uh to set oil as uh, at the, the heart of this story of at least you start off right with this early capitalist world economy sort of emergence and crystallization uh, and yet also at the heart of your story or you touched at least not only on this flow of commodities uh, but but also resistance there too, mm -hmm. right you, you spoke mostly about at the point of production a little bit of pulling up oil pipes and so on um, but I'm, I'm curious, so my own some of my own recent work focuses on piracy Mm -hmm. uh, right, and, and and the pirate figures very prominently in this story as well. From the right, the pirate is in early, very early on, cast by international law, right, as one who disrupts this early mm -hmm. flows of commodities. Right, um, yeah, when we look at the pirate today, those that are called pirates, the the, the oil figures very prominently here too. Right, where are the most the world's most you know, sources of pirates? They're, they're in the Guinea, like, you know, off, off the Guinea, Guinea, right. Um, off the coast of Somalia and Malacca so on, Straits, they're yeah. seizing oil tankers very often, and so, and yet also, right, there's also, this ties in with another theme that you, you touched on, which is decolonization, imperialism, right, colonialism, um, and, and, and historically at least we see, like Qatar, which you touched on mm -hmm. 
is a prime example. Those you know, communities that resist imperial subsumption are labeled as pirates, right? Mm -hmm. um, because there is this imperialism or colonialism, but, but really because they resist right, this yeah. imposition of a capitalist world economy. Uh, and so is oil something special here or unique when it comes to, to sort of mm. those otherings or those, those, those others of, of capitalism? The pirate, or, or is it just is it no different than other commodities or other? No, I think it is special. I, I think it is, and actually, pirate story is really quite interesting. When I was on the container ships, uh, the seafarers would make fun of me when we came into the Gulf of Aden uh, because you know they would they would stand in the in the wheel room and they would point to something in the distance and would say, "Oh my God, that's a skiff full of pirates to scare me," and you know I'll be like, "Where, where?" and I'd keep, grab the binocular and I couldn't see anything and and then they would say, "Oh." Um, <laughs> but then one of them actually turned around to me and said, well, you should, you're fairly safe because you're in a very large container ship. Um, if you were in a tanker, it would be a different story. So, and I, and I talked to them about that. So part of it, the way that the seafarers would say it is that the design of the tanker is such that it makes it particularly vulnerable to uh, attack. Uh, it is a container ship has a much bigger hold and it has off, it, it's a much further distance off the water line. Um, same thing with car carriers. They don't have like a deck to which you can climb. So that it's, it's, it's much more difficult to get onto it. Tankers are much lower slung. They're much closer to the water. So these guys come up on, alongside on a skiff. They have a grappling hook, they throw the grappling hook, they climb, they climb the thing and they can do it. Um, what may, uh, so tankers and bulk carriers are particularly vulnerable for this reason, but pirates prefer oil tankers for several reasons. Number one, um, the, the goods can be sold easily. So uh, it, the, the, the materiality of oil is such that it can, the ship can be brought to shore and it can, what's in it can be extracted. Um, second, they like it because uh, the value of it is, you know, per volume is higher than most ore or most bulk goods that go through. I think the only other kind of bulk uh, good that they really like um, is uh, grain, because obviously, again, that can be sold very easily. Um, but also, I think the, the reason that, um, and I think this is quite interesting, is that they actually recognize the symbolism of an oil tanker. So an oil tanker attracts a lot more attention than, uh, and a container ship does, than a bulk carrier. And so in a way, they, there's also the centrality, the materiality of oil as a kind of a symbolic commodity is quite important to them. The point is though about the piracy is the Jatin Duas, yeah, I'm sure you know Jatin Duas work, the ethnographic work that he does is that in fact, the pirates are not sort of some sort of a, a an enemy of humanity distant from everything. They're completely and totally embedded in these sets of protections, in these networks of trade. You know, they, they have negotiators that negotiate for the release of the tankers. They are, they probably have a boss in a suit and a large SUV sitting in an office, you know, in some capital somewhere, um, ordering them to do what they need to do. And so, um, an oil tanker provides a space for that kind of negotiation more than I think most other things does. And I think that in part, not only because of its symbolism, but also because of the ease, the materiality of oil as a kind of an object that can be captured in that particular way, that can be distributed, that can be sold on, or that can be hung on to um, because of its symbolic value. I think it is slightly different than most other things. I mean, I'm sure if it was uranium or plutonium and, you know, whatever it is, it would be quite significant as well. But then I don't think that those kinds of ships go without protection. Yeah, without army protection. So. Do you have any final questions? I don't see any online. Okay, let's go have a glass of wine. <laughs> All right. well, thank you very much, Lily, and thank you to our audience. Thank you very much. for staying at home and for asking excellent questions. I'm very grateful to, to you being here. Thank you.